Next on Unsolved Mysteries. At a uranium processing plant, a worker vanishes and his remains turn up in a furnace. Was he murdered because he knew too much? A police chief tries to run a street gang out of town and then he dies in a suspicious car accident. Hey. He's the godfather of Boston's Irish Mafia, and he's a fugitive with a million dollar price on his head. Ordinary household objects do strange things when Janine Price is around. Is there any reasonable explanation? Sound intriguing? Well, stick around. These are unusual cases that you won't want to miss. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Fernald, Ohio, 20 miles northwest from Cincinnati. For many years, this small farm town's main employer was the Feed Materials Production Center, also known as NLO. Unknown to the public, NLO was actually owned by the Department of Energy. From 1953 to 1989, it was one of the few plants in the U.S. that secretly processed high-grade uranium for nuclear weapons. When I was hired in there, they said that it was a low-level radiation plant and that uh, you didn't have anything to worry about. There was nothing back there that would bother you. And uh, just, you know, going about your business, not to tell anybody what you were doing, everything would be fine. But conditions at the plant weren't fine. In the fall of 1984, NLO was rocked by scandal when a factory accident released massive amounts of radioactive smoke into the atmosphere. An investigation later revealed that over the years, NLO had released more than 200 tons of radioactive dust particles into the air and local water sources. The effect that it has on the environment is one thing. We have an environmental disaster. But I think if you did a survey around the Fenog community, you will find very few people who trust the government now. It was a few months before this terrible accident that Dave Box, one of the plant's employees, died a gruesome death inside the factory. His family is convinced that he was murdered possibly because he was going to blow the whistle on the quantity of radioactivity that the plant was releasing. In 1981, Dave was hired at NLO as a pipe fitter and quickly earned the trust and respect of his co-workers. Dave was divorced, but remained close to his ex-wife and three children. He was great. He would do anything for us, loved his children, you know, did his job. He was just a very kind person. Dave worked the graveyard shift. On Sunday night at 11 p.m., he met his rideshare partner, Harry Easterling, in the parking lot at a local restaurant as usual. Hey, Harry. Hi, Dave. Dave got into my truck. We left. We had a little conversation on the way to work. He had talked about vacation with his kids and uh, bought a new lunch box for work and everything seemed to be normal. Dave's job was to inspect and maintain equipment throughout the factory. This included making sure that the safety pumps and dust collectors used in the uranium processing were working properly. Dave was a fairly quiet guy, but if you worked on a job, say it was high radiation level, Dave would tell you, say, you know, that particular dust collector is fairly radioactive, so watch yourself, or that pump has a certain kind of acid in it, so be careful when you work on it. Only the maintenance crew and security personnel worked the graveyard shift. 
the production lines were shut down. At midnight, Dave reported to the maintenance room for his assignment. Box? Yeah. I need you to look at the pump in building eight. I'll see him. All right. It was sort of just like any other night. He would open his toolbox, leave his keys in his lock, and lay the lock in the keys on the top of the toolbox. Dave went to one area, and I worked on a job in another plant. A worker saw Dave and a supervisor in a parked pickup truck. The eyewitness spoke to us on the phone, but he declined to appear on camera. He said that Dave and the supervisor seemed to be having a serious discussion, but he could not tell what they were talking about. He noted the windows of the truck were rolled up, even though the weather was hot and humid. An hour later, the same witness ran into Dave on the hey, factory hey. grounds. Yeah, help with that. I'm just putting my tools away. All right. He noticed that Dave was walking towards plant four, not plant eight, where he'd been assigned. It was the last time that Dave Box was seen alive. Later that morning, Harry became suspicious because he hadn't seen Dave in hours. Approximately 7 o'clock that morning, we had a safety meeting in conference room in plant four. We uh, showed up for the meeting, but Dave wasn't there. Walked back over to the maintenance building, put my tools away, and noticed that Dave's toolbox was still open. So I thought, well, he's probably working overtime. So I went in and made a few phone calls, but I couldn't locate him. So I went back out and told the security guard that Dave hadn't come out. I was going home, and I would meet him the next night at the restaurant. At around 7.30 that morning, a furnace operator in plant six told his supervisor that the casings in his oven were covered with a strange, sticky residue. The worker also noticed a strange odor. Then there's something strange in here. There's, there's all kind of big, firm crust all over the salt. Crust? Yeah, I dipped a couple of ingots in. They've got a slick film all over them. That's OK. Just go on ahead and keep dipping. Larry. Yeah, what? But there's something in there. The supervisor apparently found nothing wrong and told the furnace operator to go back to work. On the way to his next shift, Harry went to the restaurant to meet Dave as usual. It was Dave's turn to drive, and his car was already there. Wasn't anything out of the ordinary because he would uh, pull his car in and go get something to eat and then come back to the car or get something to take for lunch. And I leaned up against Dave's car and I noticed the fender was still cold. So I reached over, touched the hood, and the hood was still cold. Harry was worried. When he got to work, he reported Dave missing and had a security guard pry open his locker. Are these the clothes he was wearing? That's what he was wearing. And you haven't seen him since you left? No. Inside the plant, an investigation had begun. Plant records show that at 5.15, on the morning Dave disappeared, the temperature in the furnace in plant six had briefly dropped 28 degrees. This sudden change suggested that something foreign had been dumped into it. A worker also found what appeared to be a piece of bone on the lip of the furnace. The sheriff's department was called, and the furnace was shut down. It took three days for the molten liquid inside to cool. Only then could employees search through the waste material. My God. Those keys belong to the victim's car. They also belong to three padlocks of his, and a, a one key we believed went into his residence, but we couldn't prove that because it was bent and in and, and, uh, not, not very good shape. If the keys pulled from the furnace were Dave's, they would presumably have fallen in along with the foreign body at 5.15 a.m. But Dave's keys were seen more than two hours later in his toolbox. so. How did the keys get into the furnace? Investigators concluded that Dave was probably dead. Harry was stunned. He was also confused about Dave's keys. 
When I left the plant to go over to the maintenance shop, his keys were in the box. When I left there to go home, they were still in the box. I went home when I came back that night, his keys were still in the top of his toolbox. The supervisor closed his box, put the lock on his toolbox, and took his keys out of the lock. And from there on, I do not know what happened to the keys. Besides the keys, investigators also found a steel toe from a boot, part of an eyeglass frame, fragments of Dave's walkie-talkie, and a stainless steel wire that was looped together in three oddly connecting circles. Also recovered were several pieces of human bone. Investigators were unable to determine how Dave ended up in the furnace. They suggested that he might have committed suicide. Dave had a history of psychological problems, and around the time of his divorce, he had apparently tried to kill himself. I believe that he voluntarily went into that furnace. Two individuals that talked to him during lunchtime indicated that he was sort of depressed. He seemed to be not very talkative and was having some sort of a problem that he didn't wish to discuss. It appears that possibly it was suicide, but I don't have any evidence to back that up. That's only my personal opinion. I know my father did not commit suicide. He had purchased groceries for the week. He was planning a vacation with me and my younger brother for the following summer to Florida. He paid all of his bills for the month. There was no reason for him to commit suicide. He was probably lowered into the furnace that he was probably murdered. I can't think of any other way that it could have happened. I don't believe that uh, it could have been suicide or that it could have been an accident. Why he was killed, I think he knew something. Plant 8 had released four times more radioactive contaminants into the environment than any other plant at the plant site. I believe that they could have either shot him or they could have hit him with something, knocked him unconscious took the body back to plant six, where the furnace is. It's possible he was a whistleblower, or was going to be a whistleblower. I would hate to think that he was conscious. I can't imagine a more horrible death than that. No one ever gave us any indication or reason to believe that foul play may have occurred. There are probably people out there that know what happened, and there may not be people that know what happened either, because, uh, you know, if they knew, I doubt that anybody would tell you. Maybe fear of their life. I can't believe he's gone. I am very angry. I mean, we loved him, he loved us, and there was no reason for this to happen. Five years after Dave Bach's death, the NLO was shut down. Sadly, years later, Dave's family is unable to lay him to rest. Dave's remains, just a few bone fragments, are too toxic to be buried in the ground. They have been sealed in a drum and shipped off to a Nevada test site for storage with other radioactive materials. How Dave died and why remains a mystery. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. I, Robert Hamrick. Next, a small town policeman stands up to a street gang, and then he dies in a suspicious car accident. Chief! Rock Creek, Ohio. In the late 1960s, a group of young men began terrorizing this quiet and peaceful community. They were involved in fights. They were involved in threats. Uh, they pretty much had the entire village under their thumb when they uh, spoke, the village pretty much listened. The town counted on the Sheriff's Department for protection, but they seemed unable to stop the crime wave. 
So the citizens decided to start their own police department. I, Robert Hamrick, soundly swear. Robert Hamrick was the third man in less than six months to take charge of the new police force. The other two had left after receiving threats from members of the Rock Creek gang. But Chief Hamrick was confident that he could clean up the town. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. He wanted it to be a nice, friendly town. He wanted, you know, to get these, this gang off the streets so that people wouldn't have to be afraid of them. Almost immediately, Hamrick and his family were harassed. They just did anything that they could to aggravate him when they knew he was home. I and mean, you know, he would get fed up, take off out there after him. Five months after he was sworn in, Chief Hamrick investigated an abandoned building on the edge of town. Inside, he found an expensive sports car. It was stolen. We come across it, fingerprinted it, and we bugged the building because we didn't know who was there. Bob was hiding in the office, and when they set up, why, we jumped on and busted him. Freeze! Hands in the air! Come up! Come on, get him up! The suspects were believed to be members of the Rock Creek gang. They were arrested and released on bail. Shortly after these guys was arrested for the stolen car is when the threats came in on the telephone. But this one day, I was in the kitchen, and the phone rang. Hello? It was a man on the other end. What? And he said, tell your husband to leave things alone and get him out of town, or he's going to be hurt, and he's going to be hurt bad. One month later, during a routine patrol, Chief Hammer called in to report that he was in pursuit of a car heading west out of town. An hour and a half passed with no further radio contact. Finally, the dispatcher requested that deputies try to find the missing chief. A11, check calendar road for A5. Haven't heard from him or been able to reach him since 151. Four hours later, Hamrick's patrol car was located on an isolated road. It had hit a tree. Chief! Chief! Hamrick was semi-conscious and barely alive. A11, this is 528. Send out a signal 29. Chief Hamburg is hurt real bad. He had head and facial injuries. I was surprised to find him moving when I got there, you know. And then my next thing was to get him to keep him from moving so that he wouldn't do further injury to himself. Blood covered the back seat of the car, and Hamrick's service revolver and nightstick were missing. And the car's ignition and lights were switched to the off position. Investigators suspected foul play. Robert Hamrick never regained consciousness, and 10 days later, he died. Despite all the evidence that pointed to murder, his death was officially ruled accidental, the result of vehicular pursuit. I still don't believe to this day that all the injuries that Bob received was a result of that car accident. I believe my husband's death was not a car accident and that he was beaten to death and that it was covered up. There is evidence and people just have ignored that evidence and they've ignored the circumstances at the time and what was going on in the village at the time. Six hours after the crash, the car that Hamrick had been chasing was found at a nearby gas station. It was splattered with mud and had a damaged tire. Okay. The owner of the car said that when she dropped the car off for repairs the previous day, that the car was in good condition. Oh, no, it was like that when I got here. Were you driving this car last night? No. It was said that one of the station employees was known to be a member of the Rock Creek Gang. Knowing that he was from, hung around the Rock Creek area, and I had had trouble with him in the past. I felt that he was directly involved. One local woman claims that she overheard members of the gang bragging 
that they had murdered Chief Hamrick. They were saying, we killed us a cop, and we got away with it. And they proceeded to tell how they killed him, how they beat him in the head. They had it all planned. They set him up, get him down here on this dirt road. And they took his billy club and they started hitting him with it. They put him back into his car and then they left him there, left him to die. I knew in my heart they would never get caught. I just hope that we find out what actually happened. And if we find out who's responsible, that they pay for what they did. They took my father from me, and I think it's time that they got something taken from them. For now, the case of Robert Hamrick is officially closed. However, authorities are prepared to reopen it if new evidence is found. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, he's the godfather of Boston's Irish Mafia, and he's on the run. And if you know where he is, it's worth a million dollars. South Boston, Massachusetts. James Whitey Bulger has been described as quick-witted, hot-tempered, and ruthless. A petty thief turned bank robber who spent nine years in federal prisons, including Alcatraz. After his release, Bolger established an illegal crime empire in South Boston. According to authorities, he ruled his turf with an iron fist for more than 20 years and in the process earned an estimated $25 million. From time to time, the feds brought Whitey in for questioning, but they never had enough evidence to nail him. Whitey Bulger seemed untouchable. South Boston was a tight Irish Catholic community, a place where Whitey Bulger felt right at home. Nothing happened in South Boston without his approval. Um, every bit of illegal gaming, loan shocking, drug dealing, if it happened, he had to sanction it and he had to have a piece of it. Steven, I, I swear, if only... Bobby, Friday, 2 o'clock. In his prime, Whitey operated out of the back of a liquor store on the edge of South Boston. This is where he took care of some of his unfinished business. One night, Whitey's partner, Stephen, the rifleman Flemmy, was inside the store. So was a local bar owner named Tim Connolly. Fine, right, thanks. Sit down, sit down, sit down. How's your family? He was about to become a victim of Bulger's extortion. Whitey! I want some respect from you, Jerry. I respect you, Greg. Oh, I'll show you some respect. This is respect. This is respect. I'm gonna let you buy your life for $50,000. That's $50,000 by the end of the week. I, I can't get it all, Jimmy. Oh, yeah, well, it's good you caught me on a good day, huh? Because I'm gonna let you give me 25 in two days. Connolly returned to the liquor store with $25,000 in cash. Bulger realized that they got half of the money back and Connolly had promised the other half, and that everything was forgiven. Going out of Florida? Yeah. Connolly claims that Bulger then came out, put his arm around him, and said, now you're our friend again. Thanks. But Connolly didn't like his new friends. He went to the FBI and helped them build a case against the so-called Don of South Boston. Tim Connolly turned to the FBI because he was scared. And I think um, Connolly decided that it was time to start talking. <laughs> Are you implying that Mr. Bulger threatened you, Mr. Connolly? Yes, he did, sir. With Connolly's help, the FBI was finally able to tighten the noose around Bulger's operation. Whitey Bulger was indicted along with Stephen the Rifleman Flemmy. Also indicted was Cadillac Frank Salemi, the boss of New England's Italian Mafia. So they grabbed Stevie Flemmy, and when they did, they were unable to locate 
Frank Salemi or Whitey Bulger. Six months later, they found Frank Salemi in Florida, but they have yet to find Whitey. Frank Salemi was convicted and sentenced to 11 years in prison. Stephen Flemmy was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Whitey Bulger is wanted for 18 counts of murder, narcotics violations, and money laundering. He has been placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, and a $1 million reward has been offered for information leading to his arrest. Whitey Bulger is five feet eight inches tall and weighs 155 pounds. He has blue eyes and white hair. When last spotted, Bulger was traveling with his girlfriend, Catherine Grieg. She is also wanted by the FBI for harboring a fugitive. This video footage shows Bulger and Krieg walking near the city center in Terramina, Sicily. Update. There are new developments in this case. Here's one of our staff with details. On June 22, 2011, the FBI finally arrested Whitey Bulger, now 83 years old, and his companion, Catherine Grieg, 16 years after they disappeared. They were living in an apartment in Santa Monica, California. Bulger was sentenced to life in prison, but was beaten to death by inmates thought to be affiliated with the mob. They apparently took revenge on Bulger for being a snitch. Catherine Grieg served her time and has been released. Next, meet a woman whose psychic ability causes objects to spark, explode, and even fly across the room. Long Beach, California. Janine Price is an ordinary woman with extraordinary powers. Janine says that she's had psychic experiences ever since she was a child. They began with an ability to read minds and to predict the future. When she was just 10 years old, Janine says that she was consumed by a strong feeling that she had a sister that she had not met, but her mother refused to discuss it. She just ignored me. So then I became even more obsessed with finding out who this person was that I was seeing. Then I went prying into my parents' personal effects one time. There were a lot of pictures of children, but this one picture I came across, when I touched it, I knew it had to be the person. Mama, what? What? Who? Who's this? This is me. Where did you get this? Mom, who is it? It's nobody. It's just a picture. I I know who this is. It's my sister, isn't it? Janine's mother finally admitted that Janine did have a half-sister, Judy, from her father's previous marriage. I then told my mother that, Mom, I know I'm gonna meet her one day, and right after I meet her, she's going to die. But she says, something's gonna to happen to, to Judy. She says, I, I know she's going to die, and it's something with her head. Something's, something's, Something with blood and in her head, it's like it's going, something's going to burst. When Janine was older, she finally had the opportunity to meet her half-sister. One day, her brother, Andrew, showed up with a long-lost Judy. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Janine. Judy. How are you? We bonded very, very quickly, very closely, matter of fact. Your eyes are exactly... I never told her that I had a feeling that she was going to have a short life after she had known me. It, I just knew it wasn't my place to do so. All the time, there, there were times where I want to say, Judy, no, don't go out the door because you're not going to live. And I want to spend a lot of time with you. Within a year, Judy was admitted to the hospital complaining of severe headaches. Her doctor said that it was only migraines. 
But Janine recalls that on her first visit, she sensed that her childhood premonition would soon come true. As soon as I touched Judy, the sense of death and illness was so strong. I think I became too overbearing with the doctor. I started suggesting that he take x-rays of her, her, her skull and her brain and CAT scans. She needs a brain scan. Brain scan? Yes. Is there some medical information I don't uh, have? Do you know the name of a former doctor? No, but um, it's very important. You see, I didn't want to tell you this, but she, she has a brain aneurysm. I remember the doctor telling me, you don't even know what you're talking about. You're not the doctor. And I said, no, I'm not. But I know my sister has an aneurysm on her brain. I remember distinctly Janine warning everyone what they did for her wasn't enough, that she needed, you know, something to de t detect. There might be an internal problem. Indeed, there, were. there was, because uh, shortly afterwards, she died. Judy died at the age of 35. The cause of death, a brain aneurysm. For Janine, the loss was devastating. She sought out Dr. Michael Persinger an expert on psychic phenomena to help her understand her own abilities. When individuals feel that they can see into the future and they have verified experiences of precognition, what you find is that these individuals' brains are organized in such a way as that they can make connections between events that most people cannot. Dr. Persinger believes that psychic episodes results from short bursts of high levels of electricity within the brain, similar to epileptic seizures. What precognition is, is that you're seeing things in time outside the normal temporal frame. Well, suppose portions of the brain that mediate space and time are suddenly enhanced in terms of activity. According to Dr. Persinger, the brain of someone with psychic abilities is something like a television that can receive channels that others cannot. During what he calls psychic brain seizures, they are more capable of receiving and transmitting these signals. Of the 30 or 40 individuals with Janine's profile, many of them also report having the ability to influence objects at a distance. The experiences such as light bulbs exploding around them, radios failing, uh, glass breaking. What? Did you turn the light on? No, I was in the other room. There were several incidents where things actually exploded in my hands. I remember one time I was holding a coffee pot. We finally had to remove all our glass glasses out of the house because they were, if I touched them and if I got upset, they would break in my hand. In general, it appears that these occurrences are associated with stress and tension. And the theory is that they are a means of, of the mind or the brain to, to release the stress or tension in the individual. Janine says that a number of psychokinetic activities occurred during a very stressful time of her life. I can't talk to you like I've seen her get real upset. She and her ex-husband had, had had words, and it was a really a trying situation. Oh, what was that? Oh. It was just, just like a magnetic force just went and just, just pulled itself off the wall and slung it to the other side of the room. We were going out to the car one day, and I wasn't even angry. I was just charged up. Mom, can I have a dollar for lunch? I'll give it to you in the car. <gasps> the force was so strong that the energy that was coming off my hand actually caused sparks, and the, the keys flew up out of my hand. Marie, come here. What? Can you warm this up? One of the most dramatic incidents apparently happened when Janine asked her son to warm up a baby bottle in the microwave. I put it on for one second, and my mom got mad. She went over there and touched it and reset it. When the repairman came, he had no explanation for the microwave's sudden destruction. We do not know what type of energy it is, so we invent a term for it, PK, psychokinesis. 
By looking at the brains of people such as Janine, we might get an understanding of the form of energy that causes these types of incidents. Scientists still cannot explain the mysterious forces of psychokinesis. But the exploration has helped Janine and others like her cope with the powerful forces in their lives. What? What, what, what? Want to try plucking it in? Coming up, when a Kansas City man dies, he leaves more than $150,000 to his heirs. But who are they? Kansas City, Missouri. Like many elderly people in America, George Marsh lived the last years of his life alone. He watched the world go by from a wheelchair at his favorite window in a nursing home. But Marsh was also a man of mystery. He had quietly saved $175,000, worth as much in his time as nearly a half a million dollars today. He talked about how he used to work hard, and that was it. But just to look at him, he didn't appear that uh, he had that kind of money. George Marsh moved to Kansas City in 1917. For the next 20 years, there are no records of his employment. In 1942, he worked as a laborer for the railroad, but all details of that job were lost many years ago. In the early 50s, Marsh was night watchman for the Armour Meatpacking Company, but those records were destroyed in a fire. For 60 years, Marsh lived downtown in the Quality Hill area. These few facts of George Marsh's life were discovered by Kansas City inheritance investigator Michael Lentman. I think George Marsh was a very secretive person. He shared his life with no one. You would think you would find one person that would have had some communication or been close to George in some way, and that's not the case. George was a customer here at the store for 10 or 12 years. He was very cautious as to what he was trying to buy. He always tried to buy the sale items, the cheaper products. And as he left, he always paid cash for his groceries. In 1979, the apartment building where Marsh lived was destroyed by a fire. George lost his home and all of his belongings. Totally alone, he was forced to move into a nursing home. He just sat in a chair all day long. He didn't have anything to say. He spoke with an accent like he might have been German. He was right-handed, and the middle finger on his right hand was cut off at the joint. And he had some numbers inside of his arm. Numbers like three, four, five, seven, something like that. Voter registration records show that George may have been married. For a while, Lula May Marsh lived at the same address as he did, but she seems to have disappeared from the records by 1946. He told me one day when I asked that he had a son, but he said, I have no idea where he is. I haven't seen him for years. I don't know anything about him, and then tuned me out. He was not uh, willing to elaborate. After George died, it turned out that George had nine secret checking accounts in four different banks for a total of about $175,000. Today, that would be worth nearly a half a million dollars. But George left no will. This is all that remains of George R. Marsh an envelope that contains the uh, personal belongings of his turned over to me by the nursing home. And that's a birth certificate, some pictures, a divorce decree. According to his birth certificate, George was born in Czechoslovakia and christened Josef Zelenka. The most mysterious thing about this case is the fact there has been a change of name, apparently. The fact that he leads, leaves a lot of money. We really don't know how he accumulated that money. 
and that there's no heirs, and he cut off any connection with heirs. One paper showed that he divorced a woman named Catherine Zelenka in 1932. There is no mention of George's son or of Lula Marsh. He also left behind five old and yellowed snapshots. The name Catherine was written on the back of this picture. This one has been signed, Your Loving Niece, Eleanor. And this may be the only existing photograph of George Marsh. The boy shown here may be George's son. Update. After our broadcast, we received a call from one of George's long lost relatives, his niece, Eleanor. When I looked up and saw my senior high school picture on TV, I couldn't believe it. So then when he read your loving niece, Eleanor. I was just stunned. I was just amazed. And then the very next picture was Uncle Joe. And I said, my gosh, that's Uncle Joe. The Zelenka family lives in Rock Springs, Wyoming. George's brother, Jim, has been looking for him for years. I never know, never, no idea why he kept away from the family because there was no hard feelings. We were all united, always. The estate of George Marsh, who was known to his family as Joe, will be divided between Jim and Eleanor and Joe's other surviving relatives. But more importantly, they want to keep his memory alive. They have brought back his body to the family burial site. The money, you don't mean as much as finding out where he's at. I just feel good all over to know that I located him and know where he's at and I'd be able to bring his body back to rest with the rest of his family.